Hello and welcome to season two of the LuxCast, where we explore the intersections of Christian faith, culture, and our lives. My name is Chuck DeGroat, professor at Western Theological Seminary. In this season, we dive deep with significant thought leaders, pastors, and authors, and other interesting conversation partners as we explore one key question with each. This episode was filmed during the 2017 Writers Workshop, co-sponsored by Western Theological Seminary, Hope College, and Writing for Your Life. Today's one question goes to New York Times best-selling author and speaker, Rachel Held Evans. Reverend Roger Nelson sat down with Rachel to ask, who is your congregation? How do you know them? And what is it like to be the spiritual voice of a collective? Uh, Rachel, I'm uh, absolutely delighted to do this. Um, let me tell you a little story. Um, I serve a church in Chicagoland, and this past year, uh, our elders read Searching for Sunday together. Oh. <laughs> so a dozen uh, men and women, 30 to 70, yeah. uh, each month we would read a chapter. At the beginning of um, our time together, we would talk about what we had read and what moved us, what challenged us, what affirmed who we were, um, um, what caused us to move forward or want to move forward in some way. Um, and in doing that, um, I felt like you were pastoring our congregation. No. Oh. <laughs> so in the last couple days at this um, festival, this conference, I've heard you referred to as the spiritual voice of your generation. <laughs> and so I've wondered about the, what, you, what your sense of your own congregation. Who is your mm, congregation? Yeah. How do you know them? Yeah. Um, what is that, um, yeah, what's that experience like yeah. to be seen as the, the pastor <laughs> or, the, or the spiritual voice for a collective? Yeah, I mean, I think I see my role as basically, you know, sharing my experience and trying to find other people who have had similar experiences because I think um, th there's nothing better than hearing somebody say, you know, those two words, me too. Uh, it's not, I'm not mm. the only one. Yeah. Uh, and so I think I write with that in mind, and I think my readers connect with that. Um, but the readers that I tend to attract and that have kind of become my community are a lot of times just people who are in some kind of faith transition uh, out of one tradition into another, mm. um, out of belief into maybe doubt yeah. and to, yeah. um, or perhaps even unbelief. Um, but they're all people who are in between and feeling maybe lonely a bit yeah. in that journey and in that experience. Um, and so I kind of see myself as, um, I, you know, pastor, I don't even know if I would use the word because I think you know, the best pastors are able to really shepherd people and, and walk alongside them in life. And I have limited ability to do that with these people who read me, but I hope that I'm a companion it's, Except when, when you, when, as I've watched people interact mm -hmm. with you, their sense is that you are in fact walking with them. Yeah, that I they hope so. Have, yeah. Through what you've written, they've heard God's voice, they've been called forward, they've found yeah. new ways of being who they were. Yeah, I hope so. And, I, and that, I think that kind of emerges out of that community of people who are together saying, me too. Yeah. Uh, and so I, I see myself really as hopefully a companion to people who are in that transition, yeah. any kind of transition in their mm. faith because uh, that's a really scary, vulnerable time. And so it's, it's such a relief to find somebody who has been there, who is there, um, who can kind of walk with you through it yeah. and let you know you're not alone. Yeah. And the way you got there was simply by telling your story, yeah. right? I mean, it wasn't, uh, you didn't set out to do that. No, <laughs> no, I just set out to write. A, write. That's right. all I've ever really wanted to do is just write about my experiences. And this was an experience I had that uh, you know, this experience of um, growing up in a church and being uh, a part of a faith community and then suddenly feeling out of step with it. And mm. uh, what, what happens next? What do you do next? Yeah. Um, that's not really something I ever planned on uh, writing or leading about, but that's, that's, that's where we're at. So. so there's also a time in history right now where church is, um, mainline church is dying, evangelical church is fractured and has no idea what comes next. Yeah. So at some way you're at this right time for your voice to say, um, 
I can't do this anymore. Yeah. I'm yeah. post something. Yeah. 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 Um, do you have any sense about what's, this is a terrible word, but because it's been abused, but what's emerging? What's, mm. I mean, do you have any sense about what you hope for or what you think is coming? Or, yeah. Oh, goodness. I mean, to, right now, everything is so crazy. It's hard to even <laughs> to, to see some sort of pattern emerging. Uh, and I said this in the session just now, but, you know, one thing I try to encourage people with is, you know, when people are talking about the death of the church and everything, it, you know, death is something empires worry about. It's not something that resurrection people worry yeah, about. Yeah. So I'm not worried that the church is dying. Uh, I, well, no, I, I think it's possible that the church as we know it in America is dying. Um, but maybe this is the chance to die to some of the old ways of power and control and be raised up into the way of the cross and yeah. the way of, of Christ. So I'm, I'm of the conviction that um, perhaps, yes, the church in North America is dying in some ways, but I'm also of the conviction that it, is, it will rise. Yeah. Uh, Chesterton said, you know, the church has died many times and been raised again because it has a God who knows the way out of the grave. So m maybe God is just doing something new. Mm -hmm. What that looks like, um, it's, it's, it's hard to say sometimes, but I, I think that it looks, uh, it looks more inclusive and it looks like folks leading from the margins. Uh, when I think about the voices that are making the biggest impact and that I think are speaking the most prophetic truth into this moment, those are voices coming from more marginalized yeah. communities yeah. and you know, people of color, women of color. Um, and you also see that those are often the churches that are actually growing and thriving yeah. are you know, churches of immigrants. Yeah. <laughs> so yeah. I think the shape and, and, and the look of the church in America is going to change. And I think it'll change for the better if we yield to, the, to those voices uh, kind of crying yeah. out from the wilderness. Yeah. So, so your voice pastoral you sort of push back against? A little bit, but <laughs> I don't know. A little bit? <laughs> Prophetic? Oh think, yeah, I think that think can get your... a bit overused. So I'm very cautious. I, like I feel like I have a far too comfortable life to be <laughs> calling myself prophetic. Um, people still pay me to speak. They don't usually pay prophets to speak. Yeah. So um, <laughs> that's how I look at it. Is I see other voices as being prophetic. I hope that um, I hope that I serve by making those voices more accessible to people and amplifying mm -hmm. them. Mm -hmm. And I hope that I can serve by. I just want to be a good writer, somebody who uses her gifts as a writer to help help people and to help the church um yeah. and so i i kind of steer clear of pastor labels and definitely prophetic because <laughs> right now everybody kind of thinks that they've got yeah, like a twitter yeah. <laughs> they can just be you know <laughs> if i say something mean to somebody on twitter i'm just being prophetic about it but like yeah. uh, i think people who live you know prophetic lives there's a consistency and a rootedness and a and a pretty consistent sort of um you know they're not necessarily beloved <laughs> so uh so yeah i see myself as just a, mm. a writer who's trying to be faithful to the work that god has given her mm. and to the people mm. who happen to be in her lives and um, i'm pretty cool with that yeah so i'm a pastor who lives and works with in a particular context with a group of people that i love um and with a scripture that i love yeah and I'm mm. tethered to that scripture yeah. week in and week out. Yeah. The only thing that I have to say sort of rises up out of mm. that. I'm trying to unfold that text. Yeah. You have a kind of freedom. Mm. So some of the best stuff that I've seen and read of yours was when you were sort of blogging with the lectionary. I know, and okay. I want to get back to that when this book is done because I had such a good time doing that. But you have a free, you have a freedom to not <laughs> yeah, to I not be tethered to the text, yeah, right? I can skip those. If and I want. a freedom to not be tethered to <laughs> a particular mm. congregation. Yes. You can say with some freedom without um, so where is the where's your sense of uh, muse or how mm. do you make sense of what it is then that you want to write next, that you mm. want to say next, that you, 
where does that come from? How do you nurture that? Yeah. Um, how do you understand that? Yeah, well, and the, the irony is, like, the more freedom, it's actually the harder it is <laughs> to, um, to sort of know what the next thing is. It's, you know, creativity thrives within constraints. Right. And that's one of the things I've come to appreciate about the lectionary right. is that, like, it, because I'm every now and then I'm asked to preach, which is still I'm still finding my way in that world. Um, but I'm always grateful that I have the lectionary yeah. <laughs> because yeah. I'm like, oh, they want me to preach. I don't know what I should say. And and sometimes I'll open it and I'm like, oh no, this this sounds terrible. It's like the rich man and Lazarus, and that seems like a lot to unpack. I don't want to. And almost always I feel like the spirit moves. And that is the right text for mm. for that week for me. So I'm I'm coming to love that the constraint of that. There yeah. is actually freedom in constraint because then you you have some parameters for the th the creativity. But I also appreciate the fact that I don't or I, I recognize that some people are called to um, shepherd people uh, through you know tumultuous cultural times, and that that's a special and important yeah. calling, yeah. and that. That's not my calling. That's that's another person's. Um, but that, that does mean that I have a bit more freedom to say things politically or theologically that that might be edgy and might rock the boat um, because I don't have to be shepherding other yeah. people through that. So I think there's like the when we work kind of together, each knowing our own call, hmm. it, really beautiful hmm. work can happen. Like uh, as you shepherd people through it, I can kind of push a little yeah. bit and rock the yeah. boat and maybe give you some images to help, you know? Yeah, that's, uh, that's a helpful thing because I think you were able to, we have been having so reformed congregations are trying to make sense out of same-sex marriage and room for all in our churches. Mm -hmm. We've been having those conversations. Yeah. So our elders have been, um, we have a, a safe congregation. Yeah. Okay, for all sorts of folks. And our elders have been having a conversation about that conversation. How do we talk about this? <laughs> That's like the most reformed thing ever. Let's have a conversation about Right, exactly, about this exactly. <laughs> but, <laughs> your searching for Sunday sort of helped prod that conversation along. You were able to sort oh, of good. push that conversation along oh, gosh, in ways I that, that um, denominational reports can't mm -hmm. or some of those sort of things. Yeah. Uh, and in that way, I think you're right. There's the freedom that you have from the outside, the, um, the communal responsibility that I have here, those mm -hmm. two things uh, yeah. complement each other, work together really well. Yeah. But for me, the freedom would be absolutely terrifying. I stayed away <laughs> from um, preaching for 20 years. Yeah. Absolutely terrified of it because I was convinced I'd run out of material within about three weeks oh. and kill a church. <laughs> right. I'm not, I'm not laughing, so uh, that was just the truth. Wow. But some discovery of just trusting the text Mm -hmm. And, and mm -hmm. then having the constraint and the weekly responsibility to that text was in its own way remarkably, remarkably free. Yeah, uh, yeah. And yeah. I mean, the Bible, it's just, it's endlessly giving. It just, yeah. it will never, it never runs dry. I mean, there, I'm sure that we've all, we've all had moments never where we have dry. not given the greatest sermon or we have not written the best right. blog post, but uh, yeah. Yeah. I had a moment, epiphanal moment in a, in a, a office in a church in Schenectady around one particular text where I, in Isaiah where I, I'd never seen it before. It was, it was breathtakingly beautiful. And I thought I could dig in this soil mm. for the rest of my life. Isaiah, yeah. And never yeah. run out of material. <laughs> right. What was, do you remember what the I text? cannot remember the text. Because <laughs> I just found one the other day. I was writing something completely unrelated and it was in Isaiah. I can't remember where, but it was... Um, it, the prophet was mocking the gods of Babylon, and, it, and he said something like, you know, they are a burden to people. They have to carry them around on animals. Mm -hmm. And then speaking in the voice of God, the prophet says, but I carry Israel. I carried you in my womb. Uh, I carried you. And it's this beautiful mother imagery just like suddenly thrown in there. I never noticed that yeah, before. Yeah. But it was, it was like mother imagery, but it was also like this awesome middle finger to the Babylonian <laughs> gods that have to be carried around. Not our God. Our God carries us. It was mm. beautiful. And I thought, how could I have read you know, this so many times and never yeah, seen just yeah. how powerful that was? Yeah. It's endlessly giving. And it's, yeah. Yeah. Uh, you've been a blessing to folks. Uh, through what you've written, you've been a blessing to folks these last couple of days with uh, laughter and uh, 
a good spirit to all of this. So yeah. thanks very oh, much. Well, thank you. Thanks for your work. Uh, we look forward to reading your take on the Bible. Oh, <laughs> yeah, me too, because that means it'll be done. So. Yeah. Well, good. Thanks thank very you. much. Yeah. God bless. Yeah, yeah my pleasure.